Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the gathering of Genesis Covenant Church. Let's start by taking a deep breath in together. Can you do the deep breath, Goober? Let's do another one. And let's sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Hi, friends. I'm going to read the call to worship. I would ask that you join me in reading the all section aloud in your respective locations. God of wind and fire, when you send your spirit, we are created anew. God of mighty oceans and still waters, when we receive your baptism, we are born anew. God of bread and wine, when we eat at your table, we are nourished anew. So pour out your spirit, let sacred waters flow. Fill us with holy food. May your hearts and our hands be open wide to receive your gifts of life. Amen. Hey friends, here to read scripture for you today. The passage that I'm reading is 1 Corinthians 12, 3 through 13. No one can say Jesus is the Lord Yahweh unless the Holy Spirit is speaking through them. It is the same Holy Spirit who continues to distribute many different varieties of gifts. The Lord Yahweh is one, and he is the one who apportions to believers different varieties of ministries. The same God distributes different kinds of miracles that accomplish different results through each believer's gift and ministry as they energize and activate them. Each believer is given continuous revelation by the Holy Spirit to benefit not just themselves, but for all. For example, the Spirit gives to one the gift of the word of wisdom. To another, the same Spirit gives the gift of the word of revelation knowledge. And to another, the same Spirit gives the gift of faith. And to another, the same Spirit gives gifts of healing. And to another, the power to work miracles. And to another, the gift of prophecy. And to another, the gift to discern what the Spirit is speaking. And to another, the gift of speaking different kinds of tongues. And to another, the gift of interpretation of tongues. Remember, it's the same Holy Spirit who distributes, activates, and operates these gifts as he chooses for each believer. Just as the human body is one, though it has many parts that together form one body, so too is Christ. For by one Spirit we were immersed and mingled into one single body, and no matter our status, whether we are Jews or non-Jews, oppressed or free, we are all privileged to drink deeply of the same Holy Spirit. Imagine that you fly into the air and that you watch as the ground gets farther away from you. You feel the wind pressing against you as you fly faster and faster. Imagine that you begin to notice how beautiful things are. You notice how beautiful and green the grass is. You notice the leaves and you look across and see a great number of trees blowing in the wind. Off in the distance, you see a body of water, the ocean, and you make your way toward the coast. Imagine now that you dive into the water and somehow you were able to breathe underwater. You are swimming with thousands of fish. There are fish of all colors around you and they're beautiful. You swim past an octopus, a sea turtle, and a group of dolphins. You are captivated by the beauty around you, and then you see a big whale swim right in front of you. You are surrounded by God's beautiful creation. There are so many things here beneath the water that God loves. 
Imagine now that you swim to the surface of the water and fly into the air. And as you fly, you feel the warm sun dry off your body and you begin to think about where you should fly next. Fly fast, fly fast across the ocean and visit the beautiful mountains of France and Switzerland. Fly to the beautiful Victoria Falls in Zambia. Fly to the great rainforests in Brazil. There are so many places in this world. There is so much beauty, so much of God's creation. There are so many things and places that God loves. Imagine now that you fly straight up into the air, breaking through the atmosphere like the space shuttle. Imagine looking back and seeing the earth get smaller and smaller, and it is beautiful. Look back at this planet. See the blue and the green. Find the reddish brown land and the white polar ice caps. All the people who have ever lived have lived on this little planet and they have been loved by God from the very beginning. Now imagine that you are floating in outer space. You see the planets, you see the bright red glow of Mars, the perfect rings of Saturn, and a million zillion stars shining their light. Everything here is beautiful. There is so much that God loves. Now fly back down to earth. Fly as quickly as you can and go to your favorite forest. Imagine that you are in a forest with tall trees and there are beautiful flowers that line the forest floor. Listen to the birds sing to you. Watch as little animals gather around you. Squirrels, foxes, owls, rabbits. Imagine walking through the forest along a path and imagine that the path is coming to an end. You reach the end of the path and there are two roads to choose from. One to the right and one to the left. Which way do you wanna go? Pick a trail. And imagine heading down that trail and you can see that path is coming out of the forest and into a clearing. As you get closer to the clearing, you can see that it is a giant field of sunflowers, nearly as tall as you are. And imagine walking into the flowers, notice their beauty and pick a flower and smell it. What does the flower smell like? Imagine walking through the field of flowers. Feel the cool breeze blowing through. Notice how blue the sky looks. This world is a good place. There are so many beautiful things here. There are so many things to explore about the story of God in the world. And the most important part of the story is that God made everything and God loves everything she made. Hi, Genesis friends. This is Kara, your ministry director at church, here with a few announcements for you, coming to you from the green screen that is my upstairs office. Um, hey, giving, if you are able to give you can do so online at our website at genesiscov.org slash give, or now you can text to give if that's um, of interest to you. You would just text a dollar amount to 612-688-5644, and it'll walk you through the steps on how to set that up. Thanks for your generosity if you're able to give. Um, there's a kids coloring sheet in our liturgy today. It's Pentecost Sunday, so kids... Adults of all ages, if you are interested in a little bit of color therapy today, um, feel free to, to um, use that. And if you feel so inclined, take a picture and upload it to the Genesis community page so we can share everyone's art together. And speaking of Genesis kids, we have more um, Google Hangouts with Miss Allie this week. You can check out the details for that, the dates and times on, um, on the liturgy, on our community Facebook page, and... Um, Allie will send out the email link for the event <clears throat> to your inbox. We've got regional groups going on. If you're not in one and want to be, email me at caravee 
at genesiscov.org and there is some kind of, there's a bee in my office right now. So I'm gonna try to finish this up and not get stung by a bee. Okay, um, Food Drive, Prism, our local food shelf. Um, they are in need of donations of food and paper bags and financial donations. If you can spare some food, consider helping some neighbors out. You can drop off those um, those donations at Will and Pam Hack's house. You can see the details in the liturgy. If you are in need of prayer or care or want to get on our weekly email, please um, check out the liturgy to see what those email addresses are. Take care. Good morning, Genesis. I'm Jenny Gullickson. I'm going to be reading scripture this morning. I'm going to be reading from the book of Acts, um, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. On the day Pentecost was being fulfilled, all the disciples were gathered in one place. Suddenly they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind rushing into the house from out of the heavenly realm. The roar of the wind was so overpowering, it was all anyone could bear. Then all at once, a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. It separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each one of them. They were all filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit and were inspired to speak in tongues, empowered by the Spirit to speak in languages they had never learned. Now at that time, there were Jewish worshipers who had emigrated from many different lands to live in Jerusalem. When the people of the city heard the roaring sound, crowds came running to where it was coming from, stunned over what was happening because each one could hear the disciples speaking in his or her own language. Bewildered, they said to one another, wait, aren't these all Galileans? So how is it that we hear them speaking in our own languages? We are Northeastern Iranians, Northwestern Iranians, Elamites, and those from Mesopotamia, Judea, East Central Turkey, the coastal areas of the Black Sea, Asia, North Central Turkey, Southern Turkey, Egypt, Libyans who are neighbors of Cyrene, visitors from all over the Roman Empire, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And yet, we hear them speaking of God's mighty wonders in our own dialects. They all stood there, dumbfounded and astonished, saying to one another, what is this phenomenon? But others poked fun, fun of them and said, they're just drunk on new wine. Peter stood up with the 11 apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, my fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, you need to clearly understand what is happening here. These people are not drunk like you think they are. It's only nine in the morning. This is the fulfillment of what was prophesied through the prophet Joel. For God says, this is what I will do in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on everybody and cause your sons and daughters to prophesy and your young men will see visions and your old men will experience dreams from God. The Holy Spirit will come upon all of my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. I will reveal startling signs and wonders in the sky above and mighty miracles on the earth below. Blood and fire and pillars of clouds will appear. For the sun will be turned dark and the moon blood red before that great and awesome appearance of the day of the Lord. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
So friends, I want to address the question that I know many of you have been wrestling with over these past few days, and that is, what do we do? And what do I do? And so the first thing I want to say is the importance of lamenting. I remember when Dee McIntosh came and preached at Genesis several years ago, and she preached out of the book of Nehemiah, and she noted that in the face of tragedy, uh, the city had fallen, Jerusalem's walls were down, and there was a person that saw it firsthand, the rubble lying all over the ground, the destruction, the loss, and that person returned and told the story and lamented. Nehemiah is living under the luxury and privilege and power of what it means to be the cupbearer of King Artaxerxes, the ruler of the Persian Empire in Susa, the capital. And he has the audacity to ask his brother and those who have come from Jerusalem, how are things in Jerusalem? And Hanani responds, the survivors there in the province who have escaped captivity are in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been destroyed by fire. This morning, I want us to look at the response of Nehemiah. Because here, in the three-point process of Nehemiah's response, I think we can glean how we, maybe not we because this does not categorize me, how you as white American Christians can respond to the atrocities of people who do not look like you, talk like you, or come from your same socioeconomic background and or context. Amen? So let's look at Nehemiah's response. Hanani reports that the wall is broken down and the gates are on fire. And Nehemiah says in verse 4, When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, fasting and praying before the Lord. Point one, Nehemiah lamented. Before I can even go into Nehemiah's lament, let me just give you a few notes, side notes that we can put in the margins that I feel like it is necessary to say. Notice that Nehemiah did not say, I hear what you're saying, but I need to wait for the unbiased reporting of news media to tell me precisely what is happening in the context, even though the reporters of the context do not understand the historical nature of what actually happens in everyday life for people of lower socioeconomic status. But I'm going to wait, Hanani. I know that you live there. I know that you understand what people are seeing and feeling. I know that you have experienced the oppression yourself, but I'm sorry, I have to wait on all the facts from unbiased news stations. He doesn't ask for more facts. He doesn't ask for more people to come and report to him what is going on. Hun Nehemiah falls down on his knees and he begins to, warm, to mourn and lament. He is like the women at the wailing wall. He bemoans what is happening in the inner city of Jerusalem. We are not a nation that is good at lamenting. And I am concerned for an American church that does not grasp the importance of lamenting. Because if we don't learn how to lament, we can't ever actually make changes in the world. We have to be a people that understands what lamenting is. Lamenting is not about feeling bad. It is not simply feeling sad. Lamenting is not an expression of sorrow in order to assuage feelings of guilt and the burden of responsibility. Lamenting is like being stuck in the dark night of the soul, and there is nothing within Christianese language that can get you out of it.
I think one of the things that if we don't first lament uh, before we take action, we risk taking the wrong kind of action. And we risk even doing action to assuage our guilt versus engaging in the right kind of action that will result in good justice being done. And so the first thing we need to do is we we need to lament. And I talked last week about suffering, joining, suffering in the suffering that Christ did. And I I talked about that in light of the mission of Christ, that he said he's come to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to open the eyes of the blind, to uh, release the captives from prison. And I talked about the reality of when we do that, when we lift those people up who are being oppressed, um, we do so by standing in the face of power that is benefiting from oppressing those people and those people groups. And we suffer when we join in that work because, number one, the powers that be um, don't like losing power. But number two, we suffer because we join with those who are already suffering. And we're led into the pain that they felt for generations. And so lamenting is in part pausing to enter into the sorrow and sadness and heartache and anguish and rage and grief in whatever way that we can so that uh, we can really see and enter into solidarity versus jumping in too quickly as if we can solve a problem simply by being active. We have to lament. I remember one time Lynn Hybels, um, she's a, been an activist for years and years, and I interviewed her on my podcast, and she said that she had to come to a point when she was uh, wading into the issues of uh, violent violence in the Middle East and Israeli-Palestinian conflict, that she said she realized she had two choices when it comes to uh, engaging. And choice number one is to engage and let your heart get wrecked and weep and mourn and not know what to do and look foolish and all those things. The only other option was to disengage and not think about it. But she said, if you choose that route, you become less human. So we engage and let our hearts be broken and get wrecked and get confronted with ways in which the system benefits us while oppressing others. And by us, I mean white people. And or you choose to disengage because it's too hard. Uh, but if we do that often enough, we risk becoming less human. I think those are wise words. So I'm choosing to engage, even though I know I'll make a fool of myself, even though I'll know I'll do it wrong and get it wrong, and I'll offend people along the way, and sometimes I'll hide, and sometimes I'll do too much, and sometimes I'll do too little. But I want to choose to engage. But the only way to do that is by lamenting and entering into the pain that perhaps we um, didn't quite know was as big as it is. So first we lament. Then I think it's really important to get informed. We need to realize that when a police officer kneels on the neck of a black man for nine minutes until he dies, that that is not an isolated incident, as our friend Pastor Edrin Williams pointed out in his email to his congregation that several of us shared on the Genesis Facebook page. Uh, that that's not an isolated incident. That America has used police for centuries to control black bodies. That the prison industrial complex has done the same thing. That there is an entire system that enables a white woman in Central Park to be to call the police on a black man who simply 
asked her to leash her dog. Uh, that's not an isolated incident either. That happens because that she's been trained that the police will protect her and her kind of people. Um, I have three boys, three white boys, three white sons, and I'll never have to have a conversation with them about how to act around police officers. But anyone who has a child of color, they will have to have that conversation about if you get pulled over, what to do with your hands, about um, making sure you look a certain way and talk a certain way and act a certain way, that because that is reality. Um, I'll never have to have that conversation with my boys. Um, but if I had kids of color, I definitely would have to have that conversation. And that is an unjust, an unjust system. And so we need to get informed. There are so many different uh, ways to get informed on this. We're going to go through a book as a church, and I'm going to give more details uh, this next week, but a book called Stand Your Ground. And so I encourage you to order that book. Um, it's by Kelly Brown Douglas, and um, it, it, will, it will help. It will be one of the resources that will help us understand uh, how the system works and understand why when these things happen, uh, they are a part of a system that's working the way that it was set up to work. And so we lament, and then we get informed, and then we take some action. We protest. Uh, we call our Congress people. We uh, sign petitions. We show up in ways that are helpful and not hurtful. We continue to be learners about what it means to um, uh, disrupt with our choices, with our words, a system that is rigged against black bodies. And we pay the price to do so. We have hard conversations. We don't let racist comments slip by. We learn to take our pain uh, to God and to others. And so that pain can be transformed into works of justice and mercy. Organizations that are doing an incredible work in this regard are the Poor People's Campaign, uh, International Justice Mission, uh, Preemptive Love, and uh, some of you may choose to get involved in different ways with some organizations that are doing some really good work in the world. Uh, I encourage you to do that because otherwise we can feel paralyzed in knowing what to do. The truth is none of us know what to do, gang. Um, we all feel paralyzed these days. We all feel, and it's the temptation is because there's so many there's, there's just so much pain and evil right now. The temptation is to numb out. But I think the Church of Jesus Christ is and can be a hopeful presence in the world that takes solidarity, that joins in solidarity with those who suffer uh, for the sake of the world. I like what Robert Mulholland used to say before he died. We're not in the world for Christ, we're in Christ for the world. Uh, and I think that really is a beautiful picture. Now this Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. It's the end of the Easter season and it's the beginning of ordinary time, if there can be such a thing as ordinary time. And I think Pentecost Sunday has something to teach us about the moment that we're in. So you have to ask the question, what is Pentecost Sunday? What is Pentecost? And the easiest way to describe it is it's the moment in the life of the people of God when the gestation period is over and new birth has happened. So the verses that Jenny read a few minutes ago, 
highlight these believers that are sitting in the upper room and they're terrified because they've, they're already facing persecution for claiming allegiance to that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. And all of a sudden the spirit falls on them and they begin speaking in other languages and tongues of fire rests on their head and all these different metaphors. And Peter gives this electric sermon where he's basically just quoting the prophet Joel that says in the last days, uh, young men and young women will prophesy. Young men, old men will have dreams and see visions. And, and this is just saying that um, there will come a day, Joel says, and Peter says, this is the time where uh, we will listen to people that we norm that we hadn't listened to before and where the spirit will pour out power on all people so that the church the body of christ can be a good gift to the world that we're not left alone that we're not left to try to figure it out on our own but the spirit of jesus is really what that is empowers people to do things we ordinarily would never be able to do on our own, to stand in a kind of power and in a kind of um, vulnerable fearlessness where we are willing to suffer for the sake of Christ. We're willing to share in the sufferings of Christ, as I said last week, because we're empowered by the Spirit. And that's a new beginning in the church. That's how Genesis would, would call it. This is a new beginning. And I think it's poignant because I do believe right now in the history of the world, the church, Big C, is at the beginning of a new birth. We, the gestation period, I believe, is over. And I believe we're moving into a new way of being as a church that is expanding the walls past uh, the kinds of systems of oppression that have held it held it captive for so long. And I think the church is waking up in ways. And when I say the church, I mean the body of Christ worldwide. I don't mean any one kind of church. I certainly don't mean uh, the gathered on Sunday mornings only church. I mean the people that are committed to the mission of Christ, that Christ laid out in Luke 4, that he came, the spirit of the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to set the prisoners free, to give eye, to give sight to those who are blind, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the Spirit is pouring out power on the church, uh, on you and me, and on people all over the world to be a good gift to the world. And, and I believe we're in that moment where the gestation period has ended and the birth has begun. And what we're seeing is I think there's a whole lot of pain that's associated with this birth. There's a whole lot of sorrow and, and people are waking up to uh, the oppression that has pushed so many people down. And people are saying enough, it is time to join the good work of Jesus in the world, to bring healing and grace and comfort, to raise up those who have been brought low and to bring down the systems of power that have held people captive for so long. That's what Pentecost is all about. And then the Spirit sends the people of God, the church of Jesus, out into the world during ordinary time to do good works in the world. And so Pentecost is for such a time as this, gang. It is for such a time as this. It is the time for us to look to the Spirit to lead us and guide us into new beginnings. Uh, our church just passed a vote where LGBTQIA plus individuals uh, will be able to be married and be fully included in the life of our church for the first time. That's going to require a whole lot of learning, <laughs> really, to do that well. But it doesn't stop there. To be fully inclusive means to look to the other and to provide a place of welcome where it is not just you're welcome in our space, but it's you're welcome to come and change our space because of your presence. And we will follow your lead and allow who you are to affect who we are. It's not about just making room at the table so that as long as they play by the same rules, 
It's about changing the way the table is set. It's about allowing those who come to the table to bring their food to the table, to change the conversation at the table, to allow us all to expand and grow. That's what the work of the Spirit, I believe, is doing these days in the world. And I think it's, an, it's a tremendously painful time to be alive, but it's also an incredibly exciting time to be alive. Exciting is not the right word. It's a fertile time to be alive, meaning there's lots of life that is being stirred up. And I have energy to join in that kind of life. And I know so many of you do too. I'm so proud of our church and the way we're imperfectly trying our best to lean into loving um, justice and having mercy and walking humbly with the God that, that invites us to do something new. So on this Pentecost Sunday, may we lament, may we lament with those who grieve. May we have the courage to feel our deep pain. Uh, may we get informed so that we don't rush in and make things worse because we just want to act to assuage our own guilt. Uh, may we take action at the appropriate times in the appropriate ways. And as we do so, may we know we're not going to do it right all the time. We're really not. We're going to mess up. We're going to screw up. We're going to make fools of ourselves at times. But we're going to keep going because the alternative is to disengage and be less human. And none of us want that. Through the Spirit's power, we can do this work. Amen. Amen. Now let's pray the prayers of confession together. They're found on page four of your liturgy. I will do the leader part, and then we'll do the all part together. O oh Lord, your creation is diverse and beautiful. The whole earth and everything in it reflects who you are and what you do. We confess we have seen those who are different from us as enemies instead of family. Please forgive us. The plants and animals look to you to give them what they need in every season. When you give to them, they gather it up. When you open up your hand, they are filled with good things. We confess we try to manufacture what we need in every season and we neglect what you give us. Please forgive us. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. We will sing to the Lord as long as we live. May our meditation be pleasing to him, for we rejoice in the Lord. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Gracious God, because you are love, you made us out of that love for yourself. When we had chosen sin and fear instead of trust and love, in your mercy you sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature to live and die as one of us, and to provide a way for us to remain in love and trust once again. 
On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he, <clears throat> he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he said to them, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is the symbol, perhaps more than any other sacrament, of the sacrificial, inclusive kind of love we are invited into. It is the same table where Jesus welcomes George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, Ahmad Arbery, Philando, Sandra, Tamir, Michael, Trayvon, and so many others. And the same table where God, in his mystery that I don't understand and don't always want to accept, welcomes four officers whose knees stole breath or eyes gazed on. It is made ready for those who love God and for those who want to love God more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here long, you have, who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come, because it is the Lord who invites you. It is God's will that those who want God should meet God here. been stolen under the weight of the curse you've been broken you're not what happened you're more than the shame you were recklessly gave Silently scream through the tears you can't keep from falling. Wishing they'd pour out a night to pray through the hurt. Jesus Christ, after the
who you are and that's who we are and we'll do it together gang we'll do it imperfectly we'll make fools of ourselves at times but we'll engage because that's who we are so receive the benediction now you can put out your hands if you want to holy god you spoke the world into being pour out your spirit to the ends of the earth that your children may return from exile as citizens of your commonwealth and our divisions may be healed by your word of love and righteousness. Amen.